It's the best day of the week, New Gun Day. Let's go. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at the Taurus 856 small frame six shot revolver. Now it's kind of my mission for this channel to be practical, right? So practical for a lot of people is not spending a thousand dollars on an HK or something like that. Practical is something like this. So if that's you, you've come to the right place. This video is for you. All right, let's start off by unboxing this. So we've got the standard orange and white Taurus box. Open it up. Got the owner's manual here. Got some warnings, lifetime warranty thing, rebate card, the trigger lock that no one uses, and we've got the 856 itself. So the Taurus 856, this is a six shot 38 special plus P rated double single action revolver with a steel frame and a steel cylinder. I will actually roll in the specs somewhere on here so y'all can take a look while I am talking about this. It has an overall length of 6.5 inches, an overall width of 1.41 inches. Its barrel is two inches long and it's got an overall height of 4.8 inches. It weighs in at about 22 ounces unloaded and it's got a six groove cylinder. It has an exposed hammer and it is double single action for the trigger. It's built on Taurus's small frame revolver design. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's do a quick safety check. So we'll open it up and the weapon is unloaded. Okay, we're gonna go through this from muzzle to grip for some sort of order here. So again, we've got the two inch barrel. Just underneath that, we've got the ejector rod, which is shrouded, which is a nice feature. Up on top, we've got a ramped blade sight with some serrations on there. Got a square notch rear sight that's machined straight into the top of the frame. And then the hammer, which has some really good texture on it. It's an exposed hammer because, again, it's double single action. Just south of that, we have the cylinder release, which is a Smith & Wesson style, so you push forward to actuate it. That lets the cylinder rotate out. With the cylinder in this position, we can see the ejector rod operates nice and smoothly. We can also see that it is a six-shot cylinder, which is one more than previous models of this. Again, this is a chambered in 38 special, and it is plus P rated. The cylinder rotates back in with a nice click and lock up is very solid. The finishing on the gun is a uh, matte black and it's basic, I would say. It's not the best finish in the world. You can see here on the cylinder itself where it rotates, it's already getting marked up. We've also got a couple marks elsewhere on the frame. Uh, this hasn't really been handled all that much and just shot a few times. All in all, the finish probably isn't the best, but for what you're paying, it's serviceable. The trigger on this, as I mentioned before, is double single action, which means that every pull of the trigger is going to actuate the hammer. Uh, we'll do another quick safety check. Okay. So in double action, the trigger will pull back the hammer and then drop it. One more time for that. And in single action, with the hammer pulled back, the trigger will just release the hammer like that. And you'll notice that the pull distance is significantly shorter because cocking the hammer moves the trigger back into the release position. As far as pull weight on the trigger goes, it's predictably heavy in double action. It is heavier than the end of my scale, so I don't have an official number from me for you guys, but I have seen in other videos between 10 and 11 pounds, and that does feel about right. As far as single action goes, I measured it out at just over six pounds usually, and it doesn't feel that way for the record. The double action pull is heavy again, but smooth. It doesn't bind up anywhere. It's very nice and smooth. The single action pull, again, is six pounds, but it doesn't feel that way. It's very, very crisp. So I, I mean, it feels like four pounds to me, even though it is a six pound trigger. Now, moving back from the trigger, we have the Taurus rubber grip here. Uh, it's about a two and a half finger grip for me. I have pretty normal sized hands, maybe normal to a little small. I can get most of my pinky on there for pretty good purchase. Um, it's got some nice texturing here and some nice texturing on the back strap. It's a pretty grippy rubber and it's got thumb ledges on both sides, which is nice for lefties and righties. Um, it's also, like I said, pretty grippy. So you get a pretty good grip on it, um, even though it's not the biggest grip in the world. First impressions for what you pay, I think it's pretty solid. Uh, the finish isn't all that great, but I'm not really looking for the best finish in the world for the price point that this thing comes in. It looks very well built. The barrel is nice and straight, like you would expect. The lockup on the cylinder is nice. The trigger, again, is nicer than I was expecting, especially that single action pull that does not feel like six pounds. Uh, the only thing that I've noticed with this, other than the finish, is the cylinder release. Sometimes likes to get stuck. You have to give it a good little nudge to get the cylinder to flip out. But otherwise, once you get it out there, it's very smooth. 
flips in, locks in very nice. So what do I think of this overall? Well, like I said in the video, I think it's a very solid option for those looking for something to defend themselves with that are on a tighter budget. It fires a proven round in the 38 Special that is offered in a number of defense-minded loadings that make it viable for personal defense. The revolver manual of arms is easy to understand and easy to manipulate. There's no slides or magazines to mess with for people that aren't comfortable doing that. Basically, you pick it up, you pull the trigger, and it goes bang. And that's really all you need at this price point. Stay tuned for more videos with this thing, because as you can see, I've got a couple mods on there, and I've also got some strong opinions about whether or not they're worth it. That's all I've got for you this time. Till next time, stay safe. So, I modded my $250 revolver. Here's what I think. What's up everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Today we are talking mods for the 856. Specifically what mods I did and do I think they're worth it? So with the 856 being a budget gun, I didn't want to go nuts and throw a bunch of parts on it that was going to cost a fortune. So I decided to keep it as focused and as minimal as I could. I picked two mods that I thought would enhance the firing or shooting experience as much as possible. So with that being said, the budget mods that I picked were the Hogue Wraparound Grip and a Hammer and Trigger Spring Kit from Wolf Gun Springs. The whole grip I got on eBay for about 30 bucks. The whole wraparound grip is significantly different from the Taurus grip that comes on the gun. The main thing that I noticed is that it's significantly taller or longer, I guess, than the factory Taurus grip. It lets me get a better grip on the gun when I'm shooting. In particular, I noticed that I can get a full pinky on there as opposed to the Taurus grip that I could only get kind of half of my pinky on. There is, however, a trade-off. The factory Taurus grip has some really nice texturing on the back strap here that the whole does not, as you can see. And the Hogue, the way it sits, kind of shortens the length of pull a little bit too much for me. It's almost too compact on there. And that's something that I didn't like. If I could find a grip that has the length of the Hogue with the better length of pull that the factory Taurus grip does, I think that would be about perfect. Like I mentioned, the second mod that I did was a shooter's pack of hammer and trigger spring from Wolf Gun Springs. Installation of these was relatively simple. You take the grip off, which I already had off because I was changing the grip. There's a couple screws here on the frame that you undo and this panel just kind of pops off. With a little bit of creative finagling, you can get the springs out. After that, it's about as simple as changing a recoil spring on a semi-automatic gun, if any of you have ever done that before. It's just a lot smaller. In particular, the trigger spring is a little bit fiddly because of the way that it sits kind of inside the frame. Overall, it took me about 15 minutes or so to get that in there. Now the springs in the kit are reduced power, so it should make the hammer and the trigger action lighter and consequently easier to shoot. The hammer, actually before we move on, I just want to show you these are snap caps. The hammer is easier to pull back, noticeably easier to pull back, and the single action pull is a lot lighter, significantly lighter. The double action pull is also significantly lighter and maybe a little, little bit smoother. Now, I haven't taken my trigger scale yet to this thing after the spring change, but if you all watched the 856 initial impression video, you remember that the double action trigger pull was off my scale, so probably about 11, 12 pounds, and the single action was, I think, like six pounds, but it was very smooth and didn't really feel like that. Now, the way it is with the springs, I would say that the double action pull, probably around nine pounds, and the single action pull, much lighter, probably, probably about three and a half, four pounds now. So lighter on both ends as promised. So was it worth it after all that? Well, kind of yes, kind of no. The grip again was $30 and this one I'm gonna have to say not worth it for me. Um, it's a great grip, whole grips are awesome. The extra real estate for my pinky is great, but there are things about the factory Taurus grip that this doesn't have that I miss and paying $30 to lose some features that you already have, kind of a no-go for me. Now, the Wolf Gun Spring Kit. That was about 20 bucks, give or take, shipped to my door. And that one I'm gonna say is worth it with kind of an asterisk. I did the installation myself, but I think that there are gonna be a lot or the majority of people that are buying this gun that probably won't be comfortable doing the installation on something like this themselves. With that in mind, I would think that it's not worth it. The reduction in pull weight for the double action especially is really nice, don't get me wrong. It smooths it out quite a bit. It makes it easier to shoot. But is it enough to justify $20 plus, you know, however much more to have it installed by someone else set against the price of the gun? I mean, remember, this is a $250 gun. I don't think so. I think the factory springs are heavy, but they're workable. And I think that the gun runs just fine with the factory springs. 
So all in all for both of these, I think we're at kind of 50-50. No on the grip, yes, with an asterisk for the springs, provided that you're gonna do the work yourself. So that's it, my thought on mods for the A56. Considering the price of the gun and the price of the mods, I think that a lot of shooters would be better off just investing that money in ammunition and in training. Again, these are just my thoughts. Your method may vary, your results may vary, but that's what I think. Throw me a like or a comment if you like this content and other content that I'm doing. Don't forget to ring that bell on your way out. That's all I've got for you this time. So until next time, stay safe. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Uh, a few weeks ago, we took a first look at the Taurus 856 and how it's a solid self-defense solution for people who are looking for a simple to operate firearm on a budget. Now, since that video gained so much traction, I wanted to make a video specifically for the beginners out there that might be thinking of or already have purchased their 856 so they have some basics of revolver handling. Now, to start off with, a quick disclaimer, these are my practices. As always, your methods may vary. First off, a quick reintroduction, or maybe an introduction for some of you to our assistant today. This is a Taurus 856 revolver with a six-shot cylinder, chambered in 38 Special. It's been upgraded with a Hogue monogrip and reduced power hammer and trigger springs from Wolf Gun Springs, as well as an upgraded front sight from Taurus. Now, the first tip I have for you is how to carry the revolver or show that the revolver is unloaded. When you have the revolver just laying on a table like this, a great way to show that it's unloaded is to open the cylinder by pushing forward on the cylinder release and rotating the cylinder out from the frame. Use your fingers to control the swinging of the cylinder, don't just flick it out. The weapon is physically unable to fire when the cylinder is open like this, so doing this shows that the weapon is not ready to fire. If you need to carry the weapon, a good way to do so is to open the cylinder and then place your fingers completely through the frame. Again, the weapon can't fire with the cylinder open, and putting your fingers through the frame physically prevents the cylinder from closing. Now, you can carry this with the muzzle pointed down, or with the muzzle pointed upwards, like this. Now, the next tip I have is loading and unloading the firearm, which is easy to do now that the cylinder is open. From this carrying grip, you can use your thumb and middle two fingers to control the rotation of the cylinder as you load cartridges in with your other hand. Take a cartridge, load it in, turn the cylinder a little bit, load the next one in, and on and on and on until the cylinder is full. Just like that. When you're done, you rotate the cylinder back in and make sure it locks in place like that. It's also worth it to note here that you should definitely not do the whole Hollywood like spin and slam the cylinder shut that you see in the movies. That's a really good way to damage your weapon. Unloading the weapon is much the same process, just in the reverse order. You open the cylinder by pushing the release forward, and then you rotate the cylinder out from the frame, again using your fingers to control the cylinder and putting your fingers through the middle of the frame in this grip. This puts your thumb in a really good position to operate the ejection rod, and that's what kicks the spent shells out. You can also tip the gun over and let gravity help you kick all those shells out while you push the ejection rod. I should also note here that if you just got done shooting, this middle part of the frame where the cylinder is can sometimes be warm or a little bit hot, so just be aware of that. The next tip I have for you is the sights and how to line them up. On the 856 and on a lot of compact revolvers like this, the rear sight is super low profile and it's easy to overlook and think that you don't have a rear sight. It's actually there, it's machined right into the top of the frame here. And for proper sight picture, it's just like any other gun. You want the top of the front sight to line up with the top of the rear sight. Kinda like that. That's a proper sight picture right there. Now let's talk firing grip. Since the revolver is structurally different from a semi-automatic handgun, the firing grip needs to be altered a little bit. Specifically, your support thumb, in my case my left thumb, needs to be away from this side of the weapon. You can see if I grip this revolver with the same grip that I use for a semi-auto gun, my thumb ends up here, touching the cylinder and really close to this area where the chamber and the barrel meet. This is dangerous because during the shot, hot gas has come out from this area since it's not closed off like it is with a semi-auto gun. If your thumb is there, you might end up getting burnt a little bit. The solution here is to keep the thumb away from this area. Uh, I like to put my thumb here on the top of my knuckle of my other hand and pinning it against the grip. This keeps my thumb away from the hot gases as well as keeps it back and out of the way of the trigger and my trigger finger. After that, the firing grip is very similar to a semi-automatic handgun. Use firm even pressure on all sides, push forward with the strong hand and pull backwards with the support hand. Now, my last tip is about the trigger. The 856 is a double single action revolver, which means that it has two ways of firing. Once the weapon is loaded up and you're on target and ready to fire, you can do one of two things. You can just pull the trigger, which will pull the hammer back, and then release it, causing the gun to fire. This is called double action, since the trigger performs two actions. It pulls the hammer back and then releases it to go forward. Alternatively, 
you can manually pull the hammer back with your thumb until it locks in place like that before you pull the trigger. With the hammer in this rear position, pulling the trigger will release the hammer and cause the gun to fire. This is called single action since pulling the trigger performs just the one action of releasing the hammer forward. These two shooting modes feel pretty different, the trigger weights are different, and the feel is different, so it's always a good idea to practice both thoroughly. So that's it, a few basic tips on revolvers for beginners. Combined with the basic rules of firearm safety, these tips should set you up for success when handling or shooting a revolver. I will drop a link in the description to the links page of the blog, where you'll find links to Brownells where I got the E56 and some of the upgrades that we put on it. Throw me a like or a comment if you like what I'm doing here, subscribe if you want to see more of this stuff, and don't forget to ring the bell on your way out. Till next time, stay safe. Today, holster options for the Taurus 856. Let's take a look. Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Uh, a little while ago, we took a look at the Taurus 856. We did some initial impressions, and then we did a few upgrades that we got from Brownells. Uh, today, we're going to take a look at two popular holster choices for the 856 from Sticky Holsters and Hole Guns. First, before we get started, the usual couple of notes. Number one, you can find links to everything that I talk about in my videos on the blog links page, which is linked somewhere in the description of every video. Number two, the firearm that we're looking at today has been safety checked and as you can see, is empty. Number three, last but not least, if you like what I'm doing here, consider throwing me a super thanks. From the guns, to the holsters, to the ammo, to the optics, to everything you see on the channel, everything's paid for out of my own pocket, so any little bit always helps. With so many holster options out there, picking a holster can quickly get overwhelming for someone that's new to firearms or new to carrying. I remember when I first started, the thought of spending like 100 bucks or more on a holster was just horrifying, and I ended up buying four or five cheap holsters on Amazon, and none of them really did what I was looking for. I ended up spending, in all total, more than that $100, and I ended up with a relatively cheap holster at the end of the day. Fast forward six years, and I've got a very different view of holsters, so I wanted to kind of redo that same like affordable Amazon holster search, but with the benefit of six years of knowledge to hopefully save some of the new people out there some time and some money. So what we have here today are two budget holsters for the Taurus 856. These are both readily available on Amazon, and both cost right around 20 bucks. This is the Whole Guns Kydex holster, and this is the Sticky Holsters MD5 Medium. As usual, I will take you through each holster and show you some of the features and then talk through the things that I like and things that I don't like about each of them. So the first holster we have is from Whole Guns, and this is their Inside the Waistband Kydex Black Sweat Guard holster. This is made of Kydex, as the name implies. Uh, this is a good material to make a holster out of because it's rigid and strong for how thin and light it is. It's also relatively easy to work with because it just needs to be heated up to form into a mold. The holster is molded specifically for the 856, and it includes enough space in the molding for the front sight to clear pretty easily, as you can see up here. The material itself looks to be pretty decently thick, and the edges all the way around are rounded off, so there's no sharp edges anywhere you look. Now, for attachment, the holster uses a big foamy-style belt clip to secure it to the belt, and it's got a nice little hook at the bottom there so that it doesn't pull up off of your belt. The clip itself isn't the nicest one I've ever seen. As you can see, it's already showing some wear from just a little bit of use. But I was very pleasantly surprised to see how much adjustment is built into the design of this holster. It's got plenty of cant adjustment in both directions and even ride height adjustment, depending on where you set the clip. On the other hand, the Sticky Holsters MD5 Medium utilizes a soft shell design approach. Instead of using a rigid material like Kydex, the Sticky Holster is made from a proprietary blend of synthetic soft materials. It has a sticky outer layer that clings to clothing or skin, and the inside material is smoother and less sticky to promote holstering and unholstering. Also, since it's a soft holster, it's not designed for a specific firearm. Sizing here is done by finding your application on this chart that Sticky provides, and then ordering the corresponding holster. They've also got a quick reference chart here with their sizes and examples of weapons that will fit those sizes. As you can see here, the MD5 fits snubby revolvers such as J-frames up to a 2.125 inch barrel, which perfectly describes R856. The whole guns holster has a dedicated retention system that locks in right around the trigger guard. It's also user adjustable with this screw right here. Whole guns calls this posi click and they say that the posi click retention offers an audible and tactile click when the firearm is fully seated giving the user some added peace of mind knowing that the retention is engaged. In practice though, as you can see, there's not really much of a click. I can slide this in and out and it's really just the friction holding this in. When you slide this in, you can feel the tension increase around the trigger guard, but there's never any actual click. 
Conversely, the Sticky Holsters MD5 offers no retention. The only thing holding your gun in is the friction of the holster body against the gun here. It just slides in and out. The sticky outside of the holster creates more friction against the pocket or the belt or the clothing that the holster is carried in. And since the friction out here is greater than the friction between the holster and the gun, when you go to draw, it just pulls out. So I tested the whole gun's holster in both appendix carry, which is my preferred method, as well as a four o'clock inside the waistband carry. In both positions, I found that there's enough adjustment in the clip to make the holster sit where I wanted it to, and the clip anchored the holster to my belt really well. The clip is mounted nice and high on the holster, so it allows the gun to sit as low as possible in the waistband. And again, that's aided by the ride height adjustment that you can dial up or down depending on your body and your pants. Drawing was really easy in both scenarios as the holster lets the grip of the 856 sit out far enough to get a good grip on it even when it's inside the waistband. Reholstering is also very easy due to the hard shell design and also due to the fact that the opening of the holster is nice and wide to accommodate the cylinder of the gun. The Sticky Holster MD5 is designed to be carried in a number of ways, kind of by design, and I tested all the ways that I could think of. First in a pocket carry setup with my pants, and then in a pocket in a winter jacket, and then finally in an inside the waistband setup. And in all the cases, I was able to draw comfortably and quickly. Reholstering, however, is a bit of an exercise since the holster is soft-sided. I found myself having to kind of open the mouth of the holster with one hand and slide the gun in with the other hand in order to reholster. So now for likes and dislikes for the whole gun's Kydex holster. First off, I like the general construction of the holster. A lot of holsters at this price point are made of like very thin Kydex, but this one is actually a little bit thicker than that. Additionally, the holster has, again, as I mentioned, a really good amount of cant and ride height adjustment available. So it can flex from an appendix carry to a strong side carry to a four or six o'clock carry equally well. The holster is nice and secure with retention that's secure enough to hold this in place, even without that posi click locking into the trigger guard. And the adjustable retention is a nice added feature at this price. Now, as usual on this channel, nothing's perfect, and this holster being a $20 holster is no exception. As far as dislikes go, the main dislike that I have is kind of with the molding and cut of the holster. There's a few places where the holster is cut in not quite the right place, most notably here on the top frame of the gun, and a little bit here on the trigger guard. Now, as a result, as you can see, it's causing some rubbage on the frame there and on the trigger guard there. And combined with the, let's say, less than fantastic finish that Taurus puts on these frames, you can see that it's already causing some rubbage even with just going in and out a couple times. The second dislike is that retention system. Now, it doesn't really bother me too, too much since, as I mentioned, the retention is enough to hold this in place even without that click, but it's advertised with posi click retention right in the title of the product. So the fact that there is no click when you holster and unholster is definitely a dislike here. I think that a little more care in the cutting and finishing of the holster in general would solve both of these problems. Additionally, I wouldn't mind seeing a holster claw or wing included for appendix users like me. Again, though, at the price point, 20 bucks, this can be overlooked a good bit. Meanwhile, the Sticky MD5 is very good at filling a very specific use case for carrying. That's to say it's very good at pocket carry. The Sticky material makes drawing from a pocket pretty easy in basically every scenario. The holster covers the trigger guard very well, and the ability to use this with other similarly sized guns is definitely a value adder for what you're paying. It's made from really good quality materials, and I can see this thing lasting a very long time, even with daily use. Last, the holster did away with any printing issues inside a pocket. Now, you could tell there was definitely something in my pocket because you've got this big bump there, but there was definitely no gun shape to it that you could discern. As far as dislikes go, the main one I have is with the soft-sided opening of the holster. Since there's nothing rigid here to keep the mouth open, some extra care needs to be taken when holstering and reholstering. Most of the time, again, I found myself having to squeeze the holster to get it to open up because it would be it would be in my pocket like this and I would need to squeeze it to get it to open up so I could reholster the gun. Additionally, there were a few times when drawing that the holster would fall completely out of my pocket after I had drawn the gun out and I'd have to go and pick it up, reholster it with the holster in my hand and then reset this whole rig into my pocket. Overall, out of the two, I think that the whole gun's holster is the better buy here, as I think it's a bit more secure way to carry. It does make some compromises in fit and finish, but for the money, those shortcomings are easily overlooked. Meanwhile, the Sticky MD5 is great if you specifically plan to carry in a pocket, as long as you're aware of the shortcomings that are inherent in the soft-sided design of this holster. So, those are my thoughts on both of these budget Amazon holsters. Both the whole gun's IWB Kydex and the Sticky MD5 have their unique strengths. The whole gun's holster offers a very good fit, an adjustable cant, and a posi-click retention 
for a really confident carrying experience. Meanwhile, the sticky holster provides a more comfortable and versatile option if you've got multiple weapons that you're trying to run. Now, up next on the channel is the first impressions video on that Canik Mete SFX. If that's something that you're interested in, make sure that you're subscribed. Throw me a like or a comment if you like what I'm doing here, since it really helps with the algorithm. Also, don't forget to share this video with anyone you know that's looking for a holster for the A56. That's all I've got for you this time, so until next time, stay safe.